Hi, I'm Dr. Darrell Ellis. I'm a practicing family practice doctor here in Phoenix City, Alabama, in practice under the Piedmont umbrella. In addition to that, I'm also the medical director of our local emergency department, as well as the medical director over our local rehabilitation hospital and the medical director over the county jail. I bring all that up just to let you know that I've had the opportunity to deal with and evaluate and treat patients with COVID-19 throughout the whole spectrum of the disease process, from initial diagnosis to acute treatment to critical care management, and then post-recovery in the rehabilitation phase, and then even dealing with the post-COVID syndrome. It's important for you to know that because what I'm about to talk to you about is something that is really becoming near and dear to my heart, and that's the COVID vaccine itself. I've had the opportunity to see many people, too many people suffer as a result of the rapid spread and the virulence and the mortality associated with this viral infection. Until you've sat at the bedside of someone who is critically ill from this viral infection, it's hard to really get an appreciation for just how deadly and how insidious this thing is. I hear a lot from a lot of people now in my family practice, as well as among family members and friends, of hesitancy regarding getting the vaccination performed on themselves. There are a lot of different reasons that people have in terms of what makes them balk or hesitate about going forward with the vaccination. We've been dealing with this pandemic now for nearly a year. And as a result of that, by the middle of next month, it's projected that nearly a half a million people will have died from this uh, viral infection just in this country alone. We've already surpassed 2 million deaths worldwide, and it's going to get worse. We're in the midst right now of the second wave of this virus that occurred as a result of people intermingling and enjoying the holiday season without necessarily always practicing the proper precautions. And as a result, our healthcare system is currently overwhelmed. People are tired of being locked down. People are tired of the restrictions that have come as a result of the virulence and the spread of this viral infection and they need a break. They feel as though they're going stir crazy. Some people describe cabin fever. Well, the way that we can get this back under control, the way that we can get more to a normal lifestyle, the kind of lifestyle that we were used to prior to January of last year is by getting vaccinated. The vaccine is safe. The vaccine is effective. Well, how do you know, Dr. Ellis? Well, I know by two ways. Number one, I've read the clinical trials myself for both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. They actually are essentially the same vaccine. They're mRNA-based vaccination processes that were not developed over a nine-month period of time, which is a common misconception. The vaccine technology is something that was established and then fine-tuned over a period of about 17 years. Our first interaction with a SARS coronavirus uh, pandemic occurred first in 2003, and then it occurred again in 2012. Throughout that period of 17 years, researchers had been developing this novel technology using messenger RNA or mRNA as a way of enticing, if you will, or signaling for the cells in our body, particularly the immune cells in our body, to generate certain proteins that will inhibit the ability of the virus to enter into the cells and cause infection. They were able to get this fine-tuned once COVID-19 hit and became a worldwide pandemic. The resources, the uh, concentrated effort, as well as the collaborative effort worldwide of scientists were able to piggyback off of this 17 years worth of research and fine-tune it specifically for coronaviruses of which COVID-19 is one. What makes this uh, vaccination so effective and, and, and I'll address another concern in a minute, is that it does not use the old technology. The old technology for vaccination, and we use influenza as an example, is to take a piece of a protein coat off of a specific virus and then inject that into a human body, stimulating immune response against that specific protein from that particular virus. Unfortunately, as the virus mutates, the new mutation may not have that same protein. And as a result, it can become an infective organism, even though you've been vaccinated against 
the protein from the other virus. It may even be the same type of virus. It may still be an influenza virus, but it may be a different strain that is not recognized by the antibodies that were generated from your vaccine. The mRNA vaccines, however, specifically for COVID-19, use this different technology of messenger RNA, which does not recognize a specific protein in a specific coronavirus. Instead, it generates a response from your cells for what we call spike proteins. What spike proteins do is they target the portion of your cell that the coronaviruses gain access into the cell through and block their entry into the cells, prohibiting infection. What we usually see with respect to influenza vaccines is about a 70% protectivity, meaning that about seven out of 10 people who are vaccinated, when they are exposed to the influenza virus, will receive protection. With this new mRNA uh, technology, we're seeing 90 to 95% protection against coronaviruses. Now, I said I was gonna mention something uh, earlier, and I'm gonna come back to it now. As we're seeing, viruses, by their very nature, mutate very rapidly. They have to do so in order to be able to uh, adapt to different environments that they are exposed to, including treatments that we might be throwing at them to try and prevent their virility. They develop abilities to, if you will, become immune to some of the things that used to be able to kill them that no longer can. Whether those be extreme in temperature, whether those be you know, people using disinfectants, certain types of antiviral agents, uh, the use of different types of uh, topical therapies. I know a lot of people were investing a lot of uh, time into taking zinc supplements and vitamin C supplements as a way of trying to boost their immune system or try and decrease their risk of getting sick. The viruses recognize this stuff and they mutate to try and get around it to save their own lives, or lack of a better way of putting it. What this mRNA vaccine using this spike protein does by not necessarily targeting a specific viral type, but targeting the mechanism by which the virus infects the cells, it covers virtually all coronaviruses that are known to us now. And we have a very high index of confidence that the majority of the subtypes, the majority of the mutations that are occurring will also be protected because the virus still is gonna use in most cases the same portal of entry to cause infection. So that's number one. It's very effective and you don't necessarily have to be too overly concerned about the different uh, mutations that we're hearing about occurring in the United Kingdom and Northern California and uh, in South Africa. Now, the South African one, there is some concern there because it seems as though this viral uh, mutation <clears throat> may have found a new portal of entry, but the data is still out there. Number two, is it safe? Well, yes, it is. I know there are a lot of people who have uh, voiced some concern to me about, well, again, they put this thing out here really in a big hurry. How do we know it's safe? They've not done any long-term studies on it. Well, that's not true. Like I said earlier, this has been 17 years in research and development. Over the last nine months, the clinical trials, both Pfizer and Moderna, had 30 to 45,000 subjects that were enrolled, vaccinated, and then observed over that eight to nine month period without any real significant long-term side effects. And I say no real significant long-term side effects. There are some short-term side effects, and there are actually less side effects and more your body's signal that what it is that you've asked it to do with this vaccine is actually occurring. Once we give you the mRNA, or once you receive the mRNA, and your cells are signal produce this spike protein, that spike protein is, is recognized as being a foreign protein to your body. And your own immune response will develop antibodies against that spike protein. Those antibodies and the production of those antibodies are what produce the symptoms that we commonly see post-vaccination. And what are those symptoms? Well, you get soreness of your arm. <clears throat> Many people will. You can develop body aches. You can develop fatigue, headache. And in some cases, you may get some chills. Those symptoms are self-limited. And they're not a sign that you become infected with the virus. There's no virus in this vaccine. There's not even a piece of the virus in this vaccine. There's not a piece of a human cell in this vaccine. It's totally 
a slice of mRNA to signal the production of these spike proteins. So it's very safe. And as I mentioned earlier, very effective. Now, other reasons why people have voiced concern about getting the vaccine, in addition to efficacy and safety, is trust. You know, in the African-American community, the majority of my practice is made up of African-American patients here in the southeastern United States. We're about 45 minutes away from Tuskegee, Alabama, the same site of the syphilis experiments that were conducted by our government against an African-American population in Tuskegee. That experiment was, uh, if you will, sold to the African-American public as a vaccine program. They went in and they basically inoculated black men specifically with syphilis to see what the long-term effects of syphilis would be without any consent, without any truth, without any knowledge, and ultimately without any significant remorse. Many men died as a result of that experiment. It was an atrocity that was uh, conducted against our community. The difference between what we saw then and what we see now is simple. This vaccination process is not something that's being targeted at a single subpopulation of this country or this world. We're encouraging everyone to get this vaccine. Why is it so important for everyone to get it? Well, as we talked about earlier, in order for us to get back to what we consider a normal way of life, to be able to travel again, to be able to feel comfortable being around our loved ones again, to be able to go to movie theaters again, to be able to see our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren in some cases without risk of or concern of being infected and getting sick and in some cases dying, then a large portion of our population, not just in this country, but worldwide, has got to get vaccinated. That's the only way that we're going to be able to return to that level of comfort and that lifestyle anytime in the near future. The estimates are that 80% of the population of this country needs to be vaccinated in order for us to develop the herd immunity that's necessary to first, number one, decrease the number of deaths, number two, decrease the number of hospitalizations, and then number three, decrease the rate with which this viral infection is being spread across the country. And only then will we be able to feel comfortable about getting back together again, traveling again, uh, having family uh, get-togethers again without the risk of someone introducing a viral infection that can cause those who are at highest risk to suffer unnecessarily. The last thing that I wanted to mention is the concern that has been voiced about long-term side effects for this vaccine. There's no evidence that there are any long-term side effects. There really are not. Well, how do you know that if it's only been out for a few months? Well, we don't know 100%, but again, this is a 17-year research process that's come to fruition over the course of the last nine months. There have been no reported long-term side effects over the course of the last 17 years of experimentation and development in this particular technology of vaccination. So I think you can press pretty well assured that this has been vetted properly. It's been evaluated properly. The research is sound, and I really do believe that it's safe and effective. When the first came out, I told patients in my own practice, people who trust me, people who know me, that before I'll take the vaccine, I need to know that it is safe and effective. And that's why I went ahead and read those research studies. And I would not recommend it to one of them until I was willing to take it myself. Well, I've done that. I've taken both the first and the second doses, and I did experience some side effects, particularly after the second dose. But they were certainly not fatal, and they were very short-lived. I felt a little ill, had some chills, had some body aches and fatigue, and lasted for a total of about 24 hours. And then after that, I was right back to being my normal self again. It's well worth it. As I speak, we are over 400,000 people who have died in this country from this particular viral infection. Not a single person has died from the vaccination process. I know there's a lot of stuff on social media about people who have been vaccinated and then died shortly afterwards. And how do we know it wasn't from the vaccine that caused their death? Hank Aaron is one of those people. He was vaccinated and within a couple of days, he went from being healthy appearing to being dead. Well, Hank Aaron was 87 years old and it's believed that he had a myocardial infarction that caused his sudden cardiac death 
had absolutely nothing to do with the vaccination. So I want you to just take a moment. The Bible says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of spread some truth, hopefully give some knowledge and enlighten some of the folks who are still very hesitant about vaccination to make a decision based on information and science, based on knowledge and based on truth rather than necessarily based on fear. What I can guarantee you is that any decision you make based on fear is likely to be the wrong decision. So take the opportunity, learn as much as you need to learn, but consider the options. Number one, enough people push back and we don't get enough uh, people vaccinated, herd immunity doesn't develop, and we'll be stuck in this same cycle for another one to two years. Number two, you yourself might become infected, become sick, and even perhaps succumb to it and uh, no longer are here for your, for your loved ones. Number three, you may become a carrier. You may become infected and pass it on to other members of your family, people who you love and care for, and they will become sick and perhaps even die from it. And then number four, we never see the opportunity to see our lifestyle restored, our economy rebuilt, and our ability to be able to interact with one another the way we once did come to fruition now or in the near future. So consider those things. It's not even something, not just something that you're doing for yourself, not just something that you're doing for your family, but I consider it to be a public health responsibility that we all take the time when we have the opportunity to get vaccinated. God bless you.